One of the more vivid memories I have of my whole process of pastoral formation, from that first meeting at the Presbytery of Olympia to talk about becoming an inquirer, to the day of my ordination, one of the most vivid memories I have of that process was hearing Ozzy Noyish preach. Ozzy Noyish is a wonderful pastor down in Jersey, Argentinian-born Swiss man. He was my field ed advisor. He was David's field ed advisor. Adam, who's here with us today. Hi, Adam. Also worshiped at Six Mile Run Church. And knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say hearing Ozzy preach, and specifically hearing Ozzy read scripture, it's just a remarkable moment of sound and feeling. He, he was a great inspiration to me and remains so to this day. And I remember a particular day when he was reading a text from Numbers 11. Now that I'm thinking about it, it is entirely possible that the reason that I remember this text so well is because three years ago, this Sunday, he preached it. It would have been in the lectionary at about that time. And it's about the people of Israel wandering in the desert and whining. And for wine they did in the desert, the people of Israel. Ozzy was a phenomenal man. He's a wonderful, resonant baritone with enormous range. He preached and read with passion, and he read with this rolling accent that I will attempt not very well to duplicate for you now. This is Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 9. The riffraff among them had a strong craving. Even the Israelites cried again and again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing. The, cum the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Now our lives are wasting away. There is nothing but manna in front of us. The manna was like coriander seed and its color was like resin. The people would roam around and collect it and grind it with millstones or pound it in a mortar. Then they would boil it in pots and make it into cakes. It tasted like cakes baked in olive oil. When the dew fell on the camp during the night, the man would fall with it. I highlight this passage today, this passage from Numbers about the grumbling of Israel against the manna, because it's critical to understand a mindset that we as a church, that we as Americans are suffering under, the mindset of the departed, the exiles, the banished, the pilgrim people, the wanderers. There are parallels between this text from Numbers and the one from Jeremiah, not a one-to-one -one correlation. A connection between Israel in the wilderness and Jerusalem in captivity, they are not the same, but they both speak to something essential about the history and thought process of Egypt, of Israel, and of us here today. Remember in the Exodus story, of which Numbers is a part, all of Israel is called out of slavery by a mighty God, out of the house of bondage, the scriptures say, and into wilderness wandering before they reach the promised land. By contrast, in the passage from Jeremiah, the Babylonian captives are the very elites of Jerusalem society. Elders, leaders, nobles, merchants, rich and wealthy, worthy people kidnapped and taken to live and worship in a foreign land, a land whose customs are strange, a land which demands the worship of false gods. The two situations are very, very different, but I want to highlight this similarity, that both communities participate in a looking back, which is a grave error, a mistake neither group should have making, made using the past as a focus. Both groups hearken back to an imagined past, neither of which illusion could fulfill. For the Israelites at this time, the complaint was very, very physical and very, very meat-based. Remember, they said to one another, do you remember how good the food was in Egypt? We had meat and fish and fruit and vegetables. It was delicious. And now all we have to eat is this miraculous, crazy bread that we find lying on the ground. Ugh. Things were way better, they said to themselves, back in the old days. Do you have this experience? 
Do you know what I mean when I say that things were just way better way back when? This irrepressible longing for a time that was Days and hours shot with golden light and warmth and a sense of home and peace and health. I do. Most definitely. I have such memories, such gilded times, sunlight and water, comfy couches, fireplaces, hot apple cider. And I long, I long to return to those places, those times, Times when things were better than they are today, just as the Israelites did. I have just one problem with that. They were slaves! <laughs> they were wickedly oppressed in Egypt, the place that they're looking back to with such fondness. Casually murdered, suffering laborers. They seem to, rather conveniently, entirely forget how bad it was in Egypt. Oh, man, they say to themselves, Egypt was great! You know, aside from the senseless slaughter and the brutal crushing masonry of building buildings for people that we will never live in or occupy, things were pretty awesome! They were slaves. And they wanted to go back to the place where they were slaves because things were so much better then. I think that this is more systemic than we'd like to pretend I think there is a key message for us in the scriptures when we hanker after times and places gone by, old homes and seasons and scents. When the glory days are the only thing that we focus on, back when it was good, for whatever reason we've constructed for ourselves, we forget. We forget how bad it was, how we suffered. This is a human thing. We minimize the struggles looking back and we claim only the triumphs. It makes us feel better about ourselves. Or, this is my particular poison, we imagine a future that reclaims the glory of the past in every detail. Neglecting to account for the work and the tears and the conflict and the despair that are entailed in every human endeavor, even the ones long ago that seemed so good. We look to a future that seems eerily like those golden histories where the one problem that caused the decline from past to present is solved and everything is back just the way it was. It's a lie, my friends. It's a lie we tell ourselves to feel better about our present suffering. Yesterday was awesome. Tomorrow will be just as good, if not better. It is a lie. It is a longing to return to the bondage of the past, to be willingly chained in the Egypt of our memory. It is a lie. And God knows it to be so. And so we hear this word from the prophet Jeremiah. This word that a prophet gave to an exiled people, a word of hope in hopelessness, a word of peace in confusion, and a word more unexpected, I think, than any the people could have claimed. Of course, they wanted a promise that they were going to go home or that there was going to be a new promised land for them. And there was. God's promises never fail. But God's promises are eternal. And do not, with reliability, speak to our present moment. Jeremiah said to the exiles, in my own words, Jeremiah said, own your exile." You feel a sense of alienation and banishment? You feel like you've been kicked out of the home that you loved? Cool. You have. It's true. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit and cry and weep for the place that was? Or are you going to own it? Buy into it. Live into it. Lean into it. Own your exile. Don't bury your head in your history as if your history is the place that will save you. As if you can march back to Egypt, as if you could, let alone should. And don't dream wistfully of a future that you've constructed. 
The mirror of the perfect past or radically different, the future will not save you either. But own your exile, own where you are right now. This, I fear, is true among this fellowship. This congregation feels keenly its banishment from the past. The march of time and the sweep of history have exiled you. Quite a strange exile in which you that dream of bygone days, you have stayed steadfast and unmoving. And the world has shifted around you. You have wandered leaderless in wilderness and desert. And every conversation I hear is convinced of the fact that if we could just fix that one thing that was true in 1993 or 1977 or 1954, if we could just go back, everything would get better. And for those who dream of a bright new future with no clear path to it, we're convinced that if we could just fix one thing, everything will get better in 2018, or 2025, or 2037. Everything will just get better My friends, it is a lie. That imagined history, that longed for past, that is Egypt. It's another house of bondage. That slavery something up to something other than God's will for you. The God who dwells and lives and reigns in the community and land today. You will not find God in the misty past. You will not find God in the obscure future. You will find God in the call and heart, call in your heart to service and faith and love that sings out today, this hour, this moment. So own it. You are abundantly provided for. You are abundantly provided for. Did you know that? Did you know the wealth that dwells in this place? The wealth of love and fellowship? The wealth of hope? The wealth of community and faith? Do you know how rich you are? Beyond measure. Wealthier, certainly, than those Israelites wandering in the desert eating manna drawn from the earth. So own it. Plant gardens. Build homes in the present. Be in relationship with one another. Eat of the heavenly manna that God provides. Sure, it doesn't taste as good as the bread of history you remember, but it is sufficient and filling and present. It is here for you right now. Own your exile. And the one who has sent you into it the one whose hand is on you every step of the way, the one who holds past, present, and future in eternal hand, that one will be faithful to you always. Amen. Our hymn of response is God of Memory. It's another insert 